honor to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Bryant Myers has his doctorate in biological chemistry from the University of California at Los Angeles. He has authored several books on poverty and transformational development, humanitarian aid, and global mission. One of his most recent works includes Walking with the Poor, in which he explores Christian views of poverty, its causes, and how it is experienced differently from culture to culture. Dr. Myers has served in multiple executive roles, ranging from the Director of Field Systems to the Pres Vice President for Development and Food Resources at World Vision International over the past 30 years. Recently, his passion for Christian relief and developmental work around the world has led him to Fuller Se Seminary, where he is the Professor of International Development and Faculty Director for International Development and Urban Studies. It is such a blessing to have Dr. Myers here with us today to kick off our week focused on wealth and poverty. And now, without any further ado, will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Bryant Myers. You have no idea how relieved I was to learn that I didn't have to preach in Swedish. It would be a seriously short sermon. It's an honor to be here and to have a chance to share from God's word with you. And I'm going to work from a text that uh, you will all be familiar with. Uh, it comes in the latter part of Matthew, just before Jesus' arrest. And we read this account. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar full of a very expensive perfume which she poured out on his head as he was reclining at table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they said. The perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And when she poured this perfume on his, my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, whenever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Will you pray with me? Lord, I pray that as we encounter this text, that you would help us speak to our hearts. Give us wisdom, Lord, as we look at the world of the poor. Help us to love God and to love our neighbor. In Jesus' name. Sometimes one hears this phrase, the poor will always be with you. Um, as kind of an excuse. People tired of the news of poverty and exploitation around the world try and deflect the news by saying, well, Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. It's offered as a way to stop the conversation, to not explore the existence of the poor any further. Well, did Jesus say this? Yes. Does it mean what it appears to mean? Not really. And so that's what I want to do this morning, is talk about this, this troubling phrase. Jesus' statement comes in the context of a story that really has nothing to do with the poor at all. The focus of the story is on the woman. It has to do with a woman who Jesus said we would remember as long as the gospel is proclaimed, and this morning we're remembering her 2,000 years later. Late in Matthew's account of the life of Jesus, just before the Lord's Supper and his arrest, we're told that the woman, whose name we don't know, poured a jar of expensive perfume and worked it reverently into Jesus' hair. Jesus knew, as we learn later in the text, that the woman was honoring him by mimicking the preparation of the dead for burial. She understood before the disciples did that the cross was just ahead. 
And our favorite disciples, full of self-righteousness, criticize this act of devotion. What a waste of money, they say. The perfume could have been sold and given to the poor. That's what a World Vision fundraiser would say to you. Whatever you have, you could sell it and you could give it and help the poor. And Jesus' reply is withering. Why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing. She's done a beautiful thing. Jesus understood that the meaning of her act, understood the meaning of her act, and considered it a wonderful gift. And that's why we're supposed to remember her. She understood where Jesus was going. She wanted to accompany him in her own small way on that journey. And it's at this point that Jesus said, the poor will always be with you, but you will not always have me. Quoting Deuteronomy 15. Only he and the woman seemed to understand that Jesus would not be with his disciples for much longer. Now a footnote, an aside. For those of you who are feeling called to serve the poor, who want to do relief work or development work or homelessness work or work against human trafficking. Over my years in World Vision, I saw too many Christian activists ruining their health, destroying their families, while justifying their zeal because of their commitment to the poor. This is not a gospel stance. This is not what Jesus asked us to do. Our devotion is to be directed to Jesus, not the poor. While we are certainly supposed to love our neighbor, and especially our poor neighbor, we are to worship only Jesus. The woman understood this, and the disciples did not. Getting your spirituality and your worship in line with your social action is terribly important for the health of your soul. Okay, enough for the aside. And now back to my main point from our text. You've no doubt figured out that I am not comfortable with how some Christians take this statement of Jesus, the poor will always be with you, and rip it out of its context. I'm not. But my disappointment is deepened by the fact that there is little curiosity as to where Jesus came up with the statement. And it it robs us then of a deeper and richer understanding about God, God's people, and the poor. The section of Deuteronomy that Jesus quotes begins with a complete contradiction of the claim, the poor will always be with you. Now this is Deuteronomy, this is when the law is being handed down just before Israel goes into the promised land. The 40 years in the desert are done and it's time to take uh, God's people home. And the way this section starts is with this sentence, there should be no poor among you. There should be no poor among you. Really. This is an unambiguous claim. It's kind of hard to spin this. There shall be no poor among you. And then the text gives the reason why this should be true. Because in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, the promised land, he will richly bless you. You see, the land that God is going to give to Israel has more than enough for everyone. There are to be no poor because there will be enough. And more than enough because the text goes on and says that the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised and will lend, you will lend to many nations, but have to borrow from none. There will be a surplus, more than enough, a surplus that can be traded with the nations of the world. Now, I can believe this, because I believe in a loving, caring God who created the world for humankind would never have created a world that couldn't produce enough. I can't believe in a God that would put us into a world of scarcity. The God whom I worship would not do this, 
The God whom I worship is un, is, is, provides for life and life abundantly. So I can believe that God would put them in a land where there's more than enough before I could believe that God thinks it's okay for there to be poor among us. But there is a condition. He will richly bless you only if you obey the Lord your God. Only if you obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all of the commands I'm giving you today. The blessing and abundance of the promised land are dependent on faithfulness of God's people to keep God's commands. And it's at this point that an apparent contradiction enters the text. This is what it says. If there is a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend to him whatever he needs. Now, how can this be? We've just been told there should be no poor among you, and then we are given instructions on what to do if there is a poor person among us. Did Moses get confused? Kind of lose his train of thought? Did Moses get caught up in a contradiction? I don't think so. There will be poor in Israel, not because God's promised land failed to provide but because Israel was not faithful to God, nor to each other. There has to be a provision for the poor in the promised land, not because God failed or intends it, but because Israel failed. And so it is today, I suspect. It is a fact that there's enough agricultural production in the world today to feed every single human being on the planet well. And yet 800 million people were chronically hungry in 2011. Poor, people around, poor children around the world continue to be stunted because of chronic malnutrition. And to be chronically malnourished in the first 24 months of life means you have a permanent learning disability. It's harder and harder to get out of poverty. This text suggests that this is the case not because God's planet could not provide for the hungry and the children, but because humanity, humankind, is not following God's command. We're neither loving God nor loving our neighbor. So what did Jesus mean when he said the poor will always be with you? Did he mean that poverty is something we should simply accept? It can't be helped. There's always going to be some poor among us. Is it just the way things are? Was Jesus asking us to tolerate poverty? I don't think so. First of all, in this text, it's pretty clear that Jesus was making a point about, steward, about worship. The only reason that Jesus brought the poor into the conversation was in response to the self-righteous misreading of the devotion of the woman we are to never forget. And secondly, Jesus was being ironic in the extreme. By quoting the passage from Deuteronomy, Jesus was reminding the disciples that the only reason there are poor in God's abundant creation is because of human sin and self-centeredness. The disciples didn't care about the poor as much as they did about making points at the expense of the woman. The poor will always be with you was a rebuke. The passage in Deuteronomy closes with this demand. After the verse, there will always be poor people in the land, we find this. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your brother's and sisters, and toward the poor and the needy in your land. You see, I think that God realized that he faced a profound contradiction. God's world is productive enough to meet the needs of all. God did not provide, uh, create a world of scarcity. And furthermore, human beings made in the image of God are creative enough and productive enough to overcome scarcity when it's present. Yet the sin in the human heart 
And the curse of a fallen creation means that God's world will not be what it was created to be. Even though God never intended that there be any poor, he also knew there would always be poor people as long as there are sinful people in the world. Jesus' statement about the poor always being with us is intended to shame us, to remind us that this is only the case if we have failed. Jesus never intended to justify tolerance for the presence of the poor. So what might we conclude from all of this? First, Jesus was not excusing the presence of the poor among us. He knew full well that his Father provides enough through his creation. Jesus was reminding us with some considerable irony that the poor are always here because we have failed to keep God's commands. And the second, the real lesson from Deuteronomy is that unrighteousness, the unrighteousness of those who are not poor and of the poor themselves is the ultimate cause of poverty. At the most fundamental level, it is sin that distorts our relationships with God, with each other, and with our world. Our relationships do not work for our well-being anymore as they were intended, and the result is poverty, racism, oppression, and all other forms of injustice. Poverty was and is not part of God's intention. Third, to tolerate poverty by excusing it in Jesus' name is an insult to Jesus, who so consistently extended his affection and his touch to those who were poor, sick, inhabited by demons and suffering. To excuse poverty in the name of it's just the way it is makes a mockery of Jesus' statement of his mission in Nazareth. God's commands in Deuteronomy regarding the response to the poor among us are clear. And finally, we learn from this text that our response to the poor is to be open-handed. Moreover, we're to enjoy sharing. We are to enjoy sharing what God has given us. It says, give generously to the poor and do so without a grudging heart. The result of this attitude of sharing is that the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. If you really want to get rich, give it away. If you really want to be happy and well satisfied, Give yourself away. God's not against wealth. But he doesn't give it to you to hold and to keep. Caring for the poor is good for you. It's good for your soul. But it's good for your well-being right here and right now. Those of you that have had experiences with people who are actually poor and you know their names and you've walked with them for a little while, You've heard their stories. I learned more from them. I got more from them than I ever gave. When you really do get to know a poor person, learn their name, walk alongside them for a while, understand their story, struggle with them, they are better off and so are you. Caring for the poor is not a burden. It's not a sacrifice. It's good for you. You'll feel really, really good about yourself and you'll have a much better and intrinsically healthier view of the world. Love God and love your neighbor. That's what we are told to do. So as long as we live in a fallen world, we are to be open-handed, to lend freely and do it without grudging. In this text, it starts with the statement that if a loan's not repaid in seven years, you're to write it off. Now, for those of you in business school here, you know that's a really bad way to run a business. But you see, the goal isn't running a good business. The goal is loving God and loving your neighbor. The goal is caring for the family, not running a business. You see, if we really were doing our job as Christians, there would be no poor. The poor do not have to always be with us, and if they are, 
It's our fault, not God's. Will you pray with me? Lord, we praise you for all the goodness and fullness of your creation. For the simple fact that we started in a garden and now we live in a world with seven billion people. And yet, for the most part, the huge percentage of them have enough to eat every day. They have clothing and housing. We are deeply pained for those, Lord, who do not. We know, Lord, that this is not what you intend. You know, Lord, that if we lived more faithfully, this does not have to be the case. So help us, Lord, to develop a passion not just for loving you, but for loving our poor neighbor. That at the end of the day, there would be enough and all would be satisfied and the disciples would be picking up 12 bags full of food and fish at the end of a day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.